97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four with 97.3 ESPN.com's Andrew DiCecco. Powered by InsideTheBirds.com. He's in! Touchdown! Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, being brought to you by PlaySugarHouse.com. Sign up now, and then match your first spot up to $250. So go to PlaySugarHouse.com and win real money with their sportsbook, along with casino games from the comfort of your home. Must be 21 in order to play. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Every Tuesday and Friday, Andrew DeCecco joins us on the show to talk Eagles football as we are now less than 24 hours away from the first edition of the 53-man roster for the 2020 NFL season. And I know Andrew DeCecco has been following very closely and intently what has been going on. Of course, you can follow Andrew on Twitter at A. DeCecco NFL. Andrew, happy Friday. Yeah, Josh, good to talk to you, man. Uh, there's some big moves that need to be made here in the next 24 hours. So uh, things are happening kind of fast and furious here. Let's start with the moves that have already happened. I have to admit, I was a little surprised that the Eagles, when they announced the first round of cuts, that there were so many wide receivers on there, namely among them Deontay Burnett. Do you read anything into that that they let go of four wide receivers right off the bat. Yeah. They had, I think that, that tell, that's very telling in, in that Alshon Jeffrey could be back sooner than expected. I don't anticipate being placed on the PUP list uh, to start the season. I think he could be ready within the first few, three to four weeks. Um, and I think we'll be ready earlier than anticipated. And it tells us that they really like what they've seen from Quez Watkins and are, are a little bit, you know, a little bit hesitant to get rid of him because another team may swoop him up knowing that how young he is and the speed that he has and, and kind of, you know, he hasn't reached his ceiling yet. So teams can kind of work with him. So I think the team was a little bit, you know, hesitant to part ways with him. Um, but, you know, Deontay Burnett was a guy that I thought made a lot of sense to keep on as a seventh wide receiver. I know I had him on my 53 man roster for inside the birds.com. When you go into week one and you're not going to have Alshon Jeffrey, you're not going to have, Jalen Rager, that leaves you with Deshaun Jackson. All right, we got, I believe we have Andrew Checo back now for football at four here. So, Andrew, before we let, before we lost you due to a strange phone sound that the whole world heard that apparently made us all deaf for a hot couple of seconds there, um, you we were talking about the issue with the Eagles not having enough receivers for week one and how it's surprising that they let go of Deontay Burnett, despite the fact of the injuries with Jeffrey and Rager. Yeah. Like, you know, going into week one, you're not going to have Alshon Jeffrey. You're not going to have Jalen Rager. So that really leaves the team with Deshaun Jackson, J.D. Arcega, Whiteside, Greg Ward, John Hightower, and Quez Watkins. That to me, I mean, two of those guys are rookies. I thought it made more sense to keep a guy like Deontay Burnett in the fold, at least for the first week or two until, the receiving core kind of settles in and the, the guy, the injured guys return just to have his experience out there because there's, you know, but all those guys are going to have to be active on week one and having two of those guys that never taken an NFL snap and they're late round, they're day three picks. Nonetheless, I think that's a bit of a risky move. There could be a veteran in play that gets, uh, that gets kind of signed here as, as the cuts come in. I know that Adam Kaplan has talked about, he believes that, Alshon Jeffrey may be activated from PUP. Is there a possibility that they're leaving a roster spot open for Alshon? And that might be part of the reason why they're going this direction. Yeah, I I think Jeff, Adam, and I all had Alshon Jeffrey on our 53 man rosters. I I don't foresee him being out long enough to warrant the PUP designation. I think he's going to be in the, in the, in the plans and he could be back, you know, over the first quarter of the season. So I don't necessarily think that I think that definitely weighed into it. I do think that they probably could have and may still end up with seven wide receivers on the official 53 man roster when the dust is settled, because I really do think having two rookies on your in your receiving core to start the season is not ideal. How about the running backs? Holyfield, Killens and Warren all released. 
Uh, we've been hearing those names. Maybe someone steps up and, and has a little bit of a role, and it seems like, for at least right now, that is, they will not be with the Eagles. Yeah, you know, it, th- those are some of the guys that really that really felt the impact of not having a preseason hunter. And a guy like Michael Warren really needed you, – you can't really see what he's able to do in thud practices. You need to see him out there – in preseason games, he would have had a preseason similar to what Corey Clement had in 2017, where you could really see him run between the tackles, see his ability to see his contact balance and his ability to contribute in the passing game and, and certain areas there that you really can't see that on the practice field. Killens is more of a specialty type of player that can't really give you much out of the backfield, something like a Destin cluster. He can give you a handful of carries. You can move him around a little bit, but should there be an injury, he's not somebody that can step in and, and shoulder, you know, five or six carries a game like like a Boston Scott can. He's just too small. I believe he's about 165, 170 pounds. I think he can develop on the practice squad and maybe be a weapon. He's an embarrassment of riches. Like if you're stuck at the position, I think he'd be more of a luxury than a guy that needs to make the roster. And Elijah Holyfield could very well be on the 50, end up on the 53 man roster at some point. His skill set is what the Eagles really need there. And I think once you see the dust settle, you'll see if there's any veteran running backs that kind of get cut loose that the Eagles can kind of throw in there and, and maybe keep as a fourth. Now you mentioned the practice squad. I know there's a larger practice squad this year. So is there a hope from the Eagles that some of these guys that they're cutting, guys like Warren, Holyfield, uh, Deontay Burnett, some of these guys, they could put them on the practice squad, and then we know you can call up two guys on game day, and maybe that's a way they can work around some of these roster constrictions. Yeah, and, and, and one thing I wanted to throw caution out for fans is, you know, every year when you see a lot of fan favorites, they get released and hit the waiver wire. There's always a lot of outrage, and they should have kept this guy. Why couldn't they make room for that guy? But in all reality, last season, there was only 36 players that were claimed off waivers around the league that were released. A lot of these guys are going to end up back on the practice squad or resurfaced in some capacity. And I think this year, with, with it being such a unique offseason, teams are going to be more inclined to retain their players that already are familiar with their system rather than bring in guys that are unfamiliar to the system that really won't be able to make much of an impact until you know midway through the season especially on the practice squad when you really need to give teams good looks at the starting units, good looks and, and, and kind of emulate what you're seeing on film. I think the teams are going to go more be, they're going to be more inclined to re-sign some of their guys. Andrew Checker joining us here football for powered by the inside of the birds podcast every Monday through Friday here on the sports bash on 97.3 ESPN. You can follow Andrew Checko on Twitter at a the Checko NFL Andrew, staying on the offensive side of the ball, do you believe that the Eagles are possibly also making some of these early moves because of what may be going to happen with the offensive line, considering the fact that whatever we see the final roster at 4 p.m. tomorrow may not be the actual final roster for week one of the season? Yeah, offensive line and linebacker are two positions that I think the Eagles may look to get creative with by making a a play on the waiver wire or maybe doing a player for player swap with someone such as Sidney Jones or or a player of that mold. I think that those are two positions that really need to be upgraded and getting rid of some of those guys. Luke Jurega was a little bit surprising to see him among the first wave of cuts. He received the most guaranteed money from any undrafted free agent that they signed this offseason. I think he'll be a practice squad guy. They really don't have a ton of experience at, at depth on the offensive line. I believe Nate Herbig only played three three NFL snaps, and that's it. That's very rare around the NFL that you'll find a backup a, a backup group that has not that that is so green in terms of NFL experience. Usually, guys have played you know here or there over their career, and, and there's not there's not a ton of rookies or undrafted free agents. Usually, a veteran among the group. So I think those are two group two positional groups that they could see. Um, some outside help uh, once the you know after four o'clock tomorrow. Do you think that the Zach Ertz contract negotiation stoppage is an issue? I know he has years left on the contract, but if it gets to that last year, do you think maybe he holds out? I mean, this can definitely get ugly. Yeah, it, there's always the potential that it could get ugly, Hunter. But I, I don't, and, and I don't foresee him going into next season without having the contract redone. But that said, there's a lot of time between now and then. I think a lot of things tra- could transpire. 
if the Eagles can see their young nucleus of wide receivers, if they produce, it create it maybe the Eagles are able to kind of work something out and make themselves more of a of a twelve personnel dominant team, knowing that they have a young group of receivers that they're not really paying a lot of money to that can perform. And maybe you you really dedicate your offense to two tight ends and you pay both of those guys. It's interesting you mentioned the two tight end because a lot of teams in the NFL are going more and more to the two tight end system. You go around the league and you notice that more and more teams are using two tight ends. So, you know, on the outside looking in, it would seem like the Eagles, from my perspective, would want to keep both Ertz and Goddard as long as possible Mm -hmm. because this is kind of the direction the league is going in to counteract what other teams are doing with some of the defensive schemes. Yeah, and, and the two players are very different, and they bring a lot of different skill sets to the offense. You have Zach Ertz, who's the best route-running tight end in the NFL. He's not going to be that physical blocker that can line up and maul somebody, but you can move him around at wide receiver. You can you can move him all over the formations. And Dallas Goddard's someone who's going to be a little bit more physical. He's really developed as a blocker. He gives you more after the catch, and he can also move around the formation, and he presents matchup problems for, for corners. You know, how do you, defend, how do you defend players like that? They're too big and physical for cornerbacks, and they're too quick for safeties and linebackers. So I think, like you said, that's why you're seeing a lot of teams that if you have two tight ends with such you know, diverse skill sets, why not build around them and really add another layer to your offense? Before we flip over to the defense, I just want to ask you, is there how many moves do you think offensively between tomorrow at 4 p.m. and then – Game day, do you think we might see, considering the, everything that we just talked about? Because we know that every year teams are scouring those waiver wires. I think this year might be a little more than usual just because there's no preseason. Yeah, I think you could see a few. You know, you, you could see one at wide receiver, running back, and offensive line. You have to add depth to the offensive line. They're just not good enough right now, Josh, to – to line up and play a full slate of games with their current group. They're just not. They're one injury away, really, from from every, from every the bottom falling out. And that that's very concerning when you look at Carson Wentz's injury history and the investment that the team has made. You know, if you have your quarterback that's injured, you're not, you're not going anywhere. That needs to be addressed. And you, at, at this stage in the offseason, you're not really going to find uh, a bona fide blue-chip talent at left tackle, but you can find – a steady veteran that a team's willing to part ways with in favor of a young draft pick, or maybe one that they're overpaying that they really don't want to, they kind of want to cut ties with and don't want to pay that money to. And I think these would be wise, wise to swoop in on a player like that running back. If something happens to Miles Sanders, Boston Scott's not well equipped to handle more than six or eight carries a game. Corey Clement has an extensive injury history. He's looked great this summer. That's, that's all. That's awesome to hear, but, you really want to bring in somebody that can be that bruiser between the tackles grinder that can get those short yarges and, and is pretty reliable. Corey has, a, he has an extensive injury history. So to go into, go into the season with three running backs, two of which, you know, can't, they really can't be the, a feature runner, you know, if pressed into duty. So I think you need to look to add a veteran there. I know the Rams cut a guy like John Kelly, who maybe he's not a veteran, but he has a very unique skill set that I really like coming out of Tennessee. Um, when he was coming in, uh, going into the NFL draft, I believe it was last season. And 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 wide receiver, wide receiver is a big need because if something happens to Deshaun Jackson before Alshon Jeffrey or Jalen Rager can, can come back, you have J.J. Arcega Whiteside who's coming off a a very uneven rookie season, and then you have John Hightower, Quez Watkins, and Greg Ward. That's concerning when you look at the Deshaun's injury history. And uh, even though it's only a couple of weeks, we saw you know how th- how quickly things can change when he left the lineup last last season and in, in after in week one, and how different the receiving core looked. So I think you could they would be they would be wise to add a veteran to the mix there. I feel like your running back description of what they might need is a guy named Adrian Peterson who just got released by Washington. Yeah, Adrian Peterson fits the mold of what they're looking for. But the thing I will say is. The Eagles have a number in their mind that they're willing to pay an a lot to a veteran running back. And I have a funny feeling that what Adrian Peterson is going to warrant, what he's going to want, is going to be out of the Eagles' price range. They, they've shown that they're not going to, to compromise or budge or budge from their, their stance. That said, I think that there could be someone of, of, a, of, a, lesser, uh, of a lesser mold that, that could come in there and adequately, adequately fill that role. 
uh, around the NFL. There's going to be a ton of talent released for one reason or another, and I think the Eagles will be wise to jump on the running back position. Let's go to the cornerback position because it definitely fascinates me, and I'm looking at your projected 53-man roster. It looks like Craig James over Sidney Jones, and I just wonder, is it because Craig James is actually playing well or is Sidney Jones playing that poorly or probably a combination of both maybe? Yeah, well, Craig James, Hunter, is a player that I've gotten really good information on over the last several months. He's a player I know the Eagles really like. When you're really configuring, knowing what I know about the intricacies of putting together a 53-man roster. I know the back end of the roster really needs to be guys that are going to contribute on game day. Maybe not on on the offensive or defensive units, but probably on the third phase on special teams. And that Craig James is one of the best players that the Eagles have in that mold. He played 237 snaps on that in that unit last season for Dave Fipp, and I believe he finished fifth on the team in, in total snaps on that behind Duke Riley. Those are going to be crucial positions when you really look at their top two guys from last season, TJ Edwards and Duke Ry- or TJ Edwards and Nathan Gary. They both played 74 percent of the special team snaps. They're going to be a little bit preoccupied on defense this year, so you need to find other players that you can kind of keep on just to be able to fill the special teams role. Because Alex Singleton, he's another guy who was a core member last season. He may be on the outside looking in. So I, I kept Rasul Douglas on with Craig James, knowing that Rasul Douglas played the third most special team snaps last season. He can play on the outside, which Sydney also can, but what Rasul gives you a special teams um, uh, ability. And Sidney Jones, you know, if you activate him on game day, he lost the starting role to Avante Maddox. He, he's really not a nickel. You don't need him to play there when you have two guys in Craven LeBlanc and Nikel Roby Coleman that can play there. So what do you do with Sidney Jones? That just, to me, seems like someone who would be active on game day, but really really hampers what the Eagles can do because he doesn't play special teams. And when you compare him side-by-side side with Rasul Douglas, Sidney Jones has more value given his draft pedigree and maybe the potential change of scenery that can kind of reinvigorate his career. And he'd be the, the, the prototypical player that you can get for maybe a, a player-for-player player swap to add to the offensive line or linebacker or even running back. Is Sidney Jones more likely to be released or traded, you think? Hmm. I, I think that they can get certainly get something for him, even if it's a late-round pick. I think the team is going to be willing to roll the dice on him and not risk trying to put a waiver claim in for him because he does have a lot of ability. Look, Sidney Jones is a much better cornerback than Rasul Douglas. He gives you more. But the best ability is availability, and you can't stash a player on your 53-man roster who hasn't participated in all of training camp by, by, you know, for all intents and purposes, and you don't know about his availability throughout the season. Rasul Douglas doesn't have nearly his athleticism or, or ceiling as a corner, but you know that he's going to be available every week. You know he's going to be a significant part of Dave Fifth's special teams unit. And when you look at Sidney Jones, you just don't know what you're getting out of him. And I think another team may have a plan for him and have an opening as a starting cornerback role and might be willing to take it, take, make a play for him because I believe he's only 24 years old. Um, you know, maybe a change of scenery would do him well. How about on the defensive end position? Is there an update on Derek Barnett yet? I haven't heard much on Derek Barnett. I, I think that he's going to be, you know, I know he's a little bit banged up and he could be slowed in the early part of the season. I think the Eagles have six guys that they really could carry. I think Barnett's going to be just fine going into the season if you listen to Jim Schwartz's quotes. And I also believe that they have six guys that they that they should go with on the 53-man roster behind Josh Wood. I think Joe Osman and Casey Tuhill have both warranted their, you know, their roster consideration. When you look at Jannard Avery, who really, he, he wasn't performing well, got hurt kind of out of the picture there. I know the team surrendered a fourth round pick for him, but he really hasn't done much to kind of justify making the roster. And then Sharif Miller has had about it as invisible of an off season as a, as a, you know, a fourth round pick could have coming into his, going into his second season. You really haven't seen much out of him. He played two snaps total last season on special teams, and he was so invisible and, and not ready to contribute to the team that the team had to go out and get somebody like a Gennard Avery and surrender a fourth-round pick to get him. Um, you really don't know. You, you, it, it, to me, you can't just keep two guys in that, that, you, that, you know, that you invested fourth-round picks in if they're not performing because what's the point? I think you need to give – you know, I think that you need to give the nod to guys that have been consistent performers throughout the entire summer. 
He's Andrew Checo. Joins us every Tuesday and Friday to talk Eagles football. Of course, we are a week and change away from the start of the Eagles season tomorrow. Cut downs are going to happen, and the process starts of finalizing the roster for the start of the 2020 NFL season. Follow him on Twitter at A, the Checo NFL. Covers the Eagles for 97.3 ESPN.com and inside the birds.com. And as all guests, he appeared today on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Andrew, always appreciate the time. Guys, have a great weekend.